go ahead and dive into our presentation. We'll have questions uh, at the end if you've got questions, uh, and then we'll wrap things all up. So, uh, if you don't know any more about me other than the fact that my name is Jennifer and I'm an organizer, uh, I have been using WordPress since 2008. Uh, my husband and I run an agency called More Creative. We've been in business for 13 years as of this July. Uh, I'm a designer by trade. I have a bachelor's degree in design. I've done print design before I got into doing WordPress sites and web design. So design has pretty much been my entire life and my whole career. I have not done anything else other than a short stint nanny when I got out of high school. Um, so if you've had lots of jobs, I have no idea what that's like because I've only <laughs> ever done this. <laughs> Uh, I also uh, have a blog at jenniferborn.com, which is under my personal name, where I write about uh, making freelance business profitable, and uh, it's aimed at designers and developers, so you can check that out as well. Uh, today we are talking about website design tips to DIY like a pro. So this is a non-technical talk. You don't have to be overwhelmed by anything development. We're talking about design choices. Uh, so let's turn this on. So what that means is we are going to first talk about typography, because typography makes a huge difference in your design. You'll find things online where people will write, 95% of website design is typography. And in reality, that's pretty much almost true. <laughs> because if you think about it, the majority of your website is the content. The majority of the site is the content people are digesting and reading. It's the headlines. Hello, Jose. Everybody say hi to Jose. It, but it's the headlines. It's the subheadlines. It's the content. It's the block quotes. It's all of the things that people are reading and engaging and interacting with. So type makes a huge difference. The very first suggestion we have is stick to the basics when you're selecting typefaces. When you're looking at typefaces, fonts, a typeface, like a typeface and a font, for you, it's the same thing. For a designer, the typeface is what it looks like. The font is the file on the computer, right? So people use them interchangeably. But you want to stick to the basics. This isn't the time to get all crazy. This isn't the time to look, find something that's all cutesy because it's about legibility and readability. You want people to be able to read your content with ease. You want them to subconsciously look at the text on the page and think that's going to be easy. So we stick with the sans serif and the serif fonts in traditional typefaces that are really, really easy for the eye, right? So stick to the basics and don't get all fancy. Then we look at, there are a couple different ways to look at type and we're gonna look at these. The first is to use two weights of the same typeface. So if you look at this here, two weights of the same typeface, this font is called Museo. It's Museo Sans, it's a type kit font. Uh, this is light and bold. So in this case, the contrast between the two is really strong. I like contrast because it makes things easier on the eye. It separates things better. Skip a weight or two. So this is 100 Museo Sans Light and 700 Museo Sans Bold. So we skipped regular and I skipped semi-bold. So the contrast there is a lot stronger. <clears throat> You can also look at using different typefaces to provide visual contrast, right? So pair a serif and a sans serif, one with feet or one without feet. The idea here, though, is to pair two. We usually never want to use more than two because then things start looking like a fifth grader did it and they got super excited that they figured out there's more than Arial on their computer. <laughs> Like along the same veins, similar typefaces are a big mistake. If we look at the two different typefaces here, there's an obvious difference. Somebody made a choice to use those two typefaces, those two fonts. Here, you go, oh, somebody made a mistake and they picked the wrong one, right? If it's too close, if it's too close of a match, it looks like a mistake. It looks like somewhere you set the wrong font by accident. Or somewhere you copy and pasted from a different site and forgot to change your font to be the right one for the site you're working on. So don't use two of the same style. Again, we're looking for contrast. When in doubt, I always tell clients, when in doubt, double the size, right? If your body copy is 16 point, 
Double it to 32 for your H1, split the difference for your H2. In general, this is a good, it's easy math, and it's good practice in terms of font sizes for legibility, right? To create that contrast between the size of your headline and your subheadline, and then the size of your body copy. We usually don't talk about anything less than H2 because very rarely is it ever used. But so 16, double it, and then split the difference. It doesn't matter what size it is, if you don't use 16, if it's 12, double it to 24, split the difference for your H2. Please no library type. <coughs> The web is littered with sites that are hard to read because a designer somewhere thought it looked prettier because the type wasn't so dark. But the problem is people are spending more and more time behind screens, right? There used to not be smartphones, or not everybody had them, or they were Blackberries and they barely counted, right? So it wasn't as big of an issue. But now people are spending the majority of their day looking at some kind of screen, whether it's a phone, a tablet, or a computer. Our eyes are getting more tired than they ever have before from staring at screens. And the harder it is to read, the more tired and the more strained our eyes are. The lighter the text, the more strain you're adding to the eye. So visitors to your site, if you want them to consume a lot of content, if you want them to read multiple posts, if you want them to click from page to page and stay on your site a long time, the darker your body text, the better. Because subconsciously, if the text is too light, they're going to start to feel tired. They might not know why, and they might not have any idea it has to do with the type being too light. But that is what's going to happen. So you want to make it darker and make it easier to read. And we're going to talk about alignment as well, because this matters. You want to always pick one axis, axis that you're going to align things to. Right? You don't want one page on your website aligned to the left, one page centered, your headline, one headline centered, one headline on the left, some headline on the right. You don't want to choose different axes. So pick one. Everything on your site is going to be aligned left. Everything on your site is going to be centered, not body copy, but we'll talk about that. But you're going to have centered, or you're going to align, let's never align things to the right, but you're going to pick one axis, right? So you see here, images and copy are aligned left, right? What we also want to look at here is aligning to one axis on the top. We see this with a lot of sites, especially with people who are using off-the-shelf commercial themes. You're picking up a theme and you're starting to make changes, and maybe the theme author has things set in columns, or they have things set in boxes or widgets, and they have some. They have it set to where it isn't pinned to the top vertically, it's set to be in the center of an area, right? You see this a lot on themes that have like a big image on one side and then text centered over on the other side, and they have it centered vertically. The problem is if you upload different size images and you start messing with alignment, you're going to start having things that get janky. So we always say align to one axis. Pick a center axis, pick a left axis, pick the top, align to the bottom, but pick one and keep it consistent throughout your whole website. This also matters when you're talking about logos. So Inspired Imperfection is my family blog where I blog about all our road trips and our vacations, and the logo's a little bit of a funky size. How many people deal with clients' logos that are weird sizes or weird shapes? All the time, right? But we look at alignment, you have different choices. When looking at a logo, you align, I almost never align to the top because the eye looks at the baseline. When you're looking at a logo that's done across the top of the site in a header and there's logo and navigation, most of the time your eye is tied to either that center line or the baseline. So here, <coughs> it's tied against the baseline and here it's aligned against kind of that center point of the logo. And this is a little bit higher than the center point which is why it's aligned here along this line, along the ascender or the top part of this text here. If you look at, when you look at that, it looks, the top looks aligned. The top looks like, ooh, everything's in a nice line. And the bottom, not quite as much. Now, if this were in a colored bar, it would be a little bit different. Everything would be centered vertically. But the eye looks for the baseline, or the eye looks for something continuous. 
It wants everything to be lined up. The most beautiful people in the world are the people with the most symmetrical faces, right? The human eye looks for symmetry. It looks for alignment. And it does the same thing when it's looking at things on your website, which is why you want to make sure that they're all aligned. When Brian first started developing websites for me, because he wasn't a developer by trade, I would give him a design. And he would develop the site and say, come in and look at this. He'd be like, that doesn't line up. And he's like, yes, it does. And we'd argue, and I'm like, get a piece of paper and hold it up. Like, give me your paper. And I'd hold it up to the screen and be like, see, that one's a little higher. Right? If you're not sure if it's lining up, that's the good old-fashioned way that designers do it. Get a ruler, get a piece of paper, stick it up on your screen, and make sure everything lines up. And if it doesn't, you might need to adjust it up or down a little bit. Now he can do it with his eyeball. He doesn't even need a piece of paper. So again, we're talking align to the left. All content, right? It's okay if you want to center your headlines. I love centered headlines. But content, we always want to align left, right? All the way down the left. It's called align left, drag right in print. Not as much on the web, but align left, there's a perfect line down the left side, and the right side is all uneven. This is the easiest content for your eye to read because the eye always starts at the same point. When it's going across, it always knows where to come back to. When it's justified, you cause major problems. We have clients all the time. Can you justify my text? I want it even on both sides. No, no we can't. <laughs> Not only do I hate it, here's why. When you justify text, it creates things called rivers these lines that move through your paragraphs. We call them rivers because they're white gaps that happen vertically through your paragraphs, and the eye stops being drawn to your words and it starts following, subconsciously, it starts following those rivers, and it makes your text harder to read. The same thing that happens when you justify things is it squishes words way close together, so there's almost no gap, and it makes it harder for the eye to distinguish individual words. And then down here, I don't know what I was thinking, but it spread them all out. And now there's big gaps between my words. So if you look at it without those yellow marks, if you try to read this, you notice it feels more difficult, simply because the eye is getting stuck in those rivers. It's trying to distinguish the words where they're smushed together, and it's having to jump from word to word where they're spread out. There's not consistency in the way that it's showing up. The same thing is the problem when you align center. Right? When we, talked, when we talked about align left, when you align center, the left side and the right side are ragged. Right? The left side starts at all different spots. So when the eye gets to the end of the line and it comes back, it has to manually, like it has to think about where to start that line again. Where does it start and it has to find it. You're not necessarily conscious of this, but it's happening. And it's, making, it's giving your reader fatigue. Same thing is true with indenting your lines. Don't indent. Skip it. Right? Same thing. It's causing the eye to go in every time, and it's causing fatigue. So the easiest text to read on your website is dark and left aligned. Right? So always remember that. You might feel bored after a while. Every site's feeling the same. Well, there's a reason, and it's because it works. Now let's talk about color. We always say stick to two or three brand colors at the most. Uh, I do a lot of brand work with clients, uh, typeface selection, color selection, logo design, uh, and we always stick to two to three core brand colors. I do two main brand colors, one that's more of an accent, Right? So for JenniferBorn.com, which is the branding on this presentation, for JenniferBorn.com and my flagship course, Profitable Project Plan, the two main colors are navy blue and the teal with an accent that's this like limey green color. So across the whole site, you'll only really ever see those three colors for the core site design. On Born Creative, we went with red, black, and a tan instead of gray because it's warmer and everybody uses gray. And then Inspired Imperfections, blue, purple, and green. So these three core colors are every single place that brand is used, every single place across the site, 
sticks with those three core colors. For a lot of client sites, I even just drop down to two core colors. The more colors you have, if not designed with purpose, the more amateur your site feels. Right? It's like people get so excited that they can use color, they want to splash it everywhere. But if you look at all the top brands in the world, their use of color is minimal because the focus is on the content and the product, right? The video and the product. We also add one action color, right? I like pink, so pink is an action color on two of my sites. But an action color is only used on the site where you want somebody to take action. So for example, on jenniferborn.com and inspiredimperfection.com, my action color is pink. The only place on that site, on either one of those sites that pink is used, links, buttons, call to actions to get you to give me some money, or get on the list, right? It is just action colors. I'm training visitors that every time you see pink, you need to do something, right? You need to click on something, you need to sign up for something, you need to buy something. One of the reasons why this works as well is how many people, have you ever Googled like, what's the best color for a button? Totally have. Uh, or, I you know, deal, actually. that's or actually green. not true. <gasps> is it pink? No, green. Yep. no. There is no right color for a button. Dun, dun, dun. Like how many people have read, never make your button red because that's a negative mean color and it's an angry color. There are so many blog posts that say that. It is absolutely not true. If your entire site is greens, blues-ish, even, even teetering on purple-ish, right? Red is a contrasting color. Buttons need to be a contrasting color. All that matters is that your button or your call to action or your action color is drastically different from everything else on that page. Contrast. I hate yellow, so I would never make a yellow. Um, <laughs> yellow is hard to read, so I would go for a yellow orange if I were gonna go that way. Like if a client needed a yellowy color, I'd go for like a yellowy orange. Like a Pantone 130 is my probably my go-to yellow, which is crazy that I know that. But I worked for Caterpillar, I did freelance work for Caterpillar for a while. Um, but anyway, that's beside the point. All that matters for your action color or your button color is that it's a contrasting color that if the only place it's showing up is that button or that call to action. Because contrast is what's gonna draw the eye to it, right? So there's no right button color or right call to action color. You just want contrast. So if we look at jenniferborn.com, the site is navy blue and the teal and the lime green. On a blog post, the only place you're seeing pink is showing up in a link to download my content upgrade. Right, download, I don't even know what that's but system, download my systems workbook. Right, the only place you're seeing pink in that blog post is right there. And it gets the eye right to that, and they go, ooh, what is that? I think I use it for blog posts too, but I barely ever use blog posts. Uh, on the sales page for Profitable Project Plan, the only place you're looking at pink is the buy buttons when enrollment is open or when enrollment is closed, it's get on the waiting list. It's the only spot on the whole page. So it stands out and it gets the eye and it stops the scroll when somebody is scrolling because it's different. On Born Creative, same thing. The only place we're seeing blue is in the action button to fill out our project inquiry form or like the read more buttons on the blog to click through and look at the whole entire blog post. Inspired and Perfection, same thing. The only place you're seeing pink is the button to sign up for my list and the links to move around on the site. So again, I'm training people to take action when they see that specific color. Now let's talk about pictures. Those people make bad decisions. Yeah. I made bad decisions, right? Nobody is immune to picking bad images. I picked terrible images for the Born Creative website for like the first five years we were in business. Um, maybe even longer than that. And then we did a site redesign and I had to go back and pick all new pictures for every single blog post, for like 500 blog posts. I had to put new images in because I was so embarrassed of my bad choices. So if you have bad images, it's okay. Even pros make a bad choice. The problem is stock photo sites are full of terrible images. 
You do a search and you get served horrible images. It takes work to find the good ones. So we're gonna talk about best practices in using images and we're gonna look at some samples and we're gonna help you pick some better images. The first is use full width images. Your feed may have its support for left and right aligned images, right? When you upload an image and you're gonna add it to your site, it lets you pick a line center, a line left, a line right. Don't ever pick left or right, right? Always pick center and always go full width. Find out what the content width of your, your content is. Find out what the content width is and make sure all your images are that width. My content on uh, Inspiring Perfection, for example, is 800 pixels wide. So every image I use is 800 pixels wide unless I want it to break that, um, which I can because my husband's really. Um, but you want to also make sure your full width images are at least 600 pixels wide. And there's a reason for that. Have you ever shared a post or something on Facebook and you don't get the big beautiful image, it just shares it in like this little square and like part of your image is cut off and you're like, that's not pretty. How come I don't get the big image like everybody else? It's because your picture is too small. If your picture isn't at least 600 pixels wide, it's gonna display your featured image or your image as a little square instead of the nice big image. So you want to make sure it's at least 600 pixels, right? So Inspired Imperfection, in addition to my family, travels I write about food. So full width images on any device always look great, right? It doesn't matter if you're on desktop, a tablet, or a phone. It's always going to stretch to the full width of your content, right? And it looks beautiful no matter what device your user is using. Unfortunately, if you left or right align things, mm -hmm. this happens. Wonky, weird white space. And you're like, something's broken. Or somebody made a bad choice. Or over here, see how there's like one word? Because the next word was too long to fit in that space? And there's one, one little sad word at the top all by itself. <laughs> this is what left and right aligning images does. So we always tell every client, full width images for everything. If you use advanced custom fields, if you build custom names, if you use advanced custom fields and you add an image uploader, you know what's super awesome? You can put in a little note that says the image has to be 800 by 450 pixels. And then you can make it so they can't upload anything that's not that. How great is that? Because how many people have built a site, give it to a client, and they upload the wrong size picture for the space and you're like, what are you doing? And somebody wants a link to a site you built when you're trying to sell them new work, and you're like, I can give you this link, but the client's ruining it. Don't judge me. <laughs> right? So we always say, go with images. It fixes all the problems. Also, you want to avoid cheesy stock images. The super happy people, the awkward poses. <clears throat> we all want to avoid those. It's hard to find, but one of the things I get asked the most when I'm doing, uh, when we're talking about design and the courses that I lead uh, for designers and developers is, the pictures on your sites are so great. How do you choose stock photos? I'm like, I used to be you. Let's look at these ugly photos, right? <laughs> you search for a stock image and you get cheesy guy pointing at the picture with his little smile. And you're like, nobody is laughing at anything that you're talking about right now. Or the, the word that you're like, I'm writing a blog post about my vision for business. And so I get a blog post that says vision. I don't think we need to be that literal. Instead, you want to look for this image. Same thing, right? People are pointing at the screen. It's two people in both images. Two people are talking about whatever is on the computer screen. The difference is you can't see their face. No cheesy, smiling posed a guy, right? So the simple thing is look for the same kind of picture that you want, but look for one that the head is cut off, right? <laughs> it's zoomed in on the hands. It's zoomed in on people doing the thing that you want to show. Or if you can't find that, find one that you can just crop it to the core part of the image of the people's hands doing something. Show the action, not the cheesy smiling face. Or down in the bottom, instead of looking for a, a picture that has the word on it that's totally obvious and didn't take any effort, 
Instead of looking for one that says, if I was writing a blog post about vision, looking at one of those telescopes, that vision, looking out into the future, seeing something far away, right? Look for things that are going to communicate your message but not be so obvious. Same kind of thing. I'm writing about SEO. I'm going to use this card catalog that says search because people totally store words in card catalog, right? Or strategy. They're terrible. But instead, if you're talking about search, look for something like a magnifying glass where people are looking for something, right? Or strategy. Think of the game of chess where people need strategy to be able to do that, right? So you want to think of things that aren't quite as obvious. Cut out those cheesy faces. And my god, avoid anything that's been cut out, right? They call it isolated, right? You want to avoid anything sitting on a white background that's just floating in a sea of nothingness. And no clip art either. <clears throat> Let's not do clip art, right? Or again, cheesy smiling faces. So if you're talking about time, it's better to find something that has visual context. And again, we're looking at no cheesy face, right? We still get the gist of the guy. We still see a little bit of his face, but he's looking away. A lot of times when I'm searching for stock photos, I'll search for what it is and I say back of head. Or when it says what to exclude, I'm like smiling, happy face. Right? I'm like the most negative stock image searcher ever. <laughs> I want the back of your head and I want to exclude all happy smiling faces. But then I find great photos like this. Or if I need the woman on the phone, I can find one of her actually working that she looks like she's talking on the phone, not just posing with her phone, right? And you want to show people actually doing things. When you're looking at using images on your website, especially on a page that asks for a conversion, especially on a page where you're asking for an opt-in, or you're asking for somebody to buy something, or to sign up, to register for your webinar, to whatever it might be, you want to use visual cues, right? Leverage the eyes. This is the only time I'm cool with using faces. This woman, <laughs> right, is looking right at my opt-in. <laughs> when you look at this page and you look at that picture, what's the first thing your eyeballs do? You look where she's looking, right? You're like, what's she looking at? You look down and you're like, oh, and you look up at that opt-in. This is the most boring ass often ever. I was going to try to not say ass. I want Lord Vader to put me back on schedule. I don't know what you're talking about. No image, right? No great headline. Doesn't show me what I'm getting, but I'm still looking at it. I'm still paying attention to it. My eye is still drawn to that opt-in because the picture is directing me there. The eyeballs of that woman are sending me there. So on an opt-in page, if you're asking people to sign up or register, find an image that's pointing in that direction, right? They say women and pets, women and like animals are the two most popular pictures that convert on a landing page ever. So if you look at a lot of skeezy internet marketers, they have their opt-in and they have pictures of women on their pages. If you look at a lot of brands that are asking for online conversions and they're featuring moms, carefree women out in the meadow, whatever, they're all, it's all because study after study after study has shown cute animals, kids and babies, and women convert the best in terms of pictures. So sorry dudes. But, so really, if you're looking at conversions, look for kids and babies, dogs and pets, and women. And ideally have them looking in that direction or have something in the image pointing in that direction. Right, something in the image guiding people in that direction. So you just naturally have the attention on the page going right to that opt-in or right to that call to action. Now, I also want to talk about content because like we started off saying, 95% of web design is content. So this is what you get from your client. Big paragraphs most of the time. Sometimes you can barely get your client to write a word. 
But when you're lucky enough to get good, a lot of content, you get it from your client and most of the time it's not formatted, it's not all pretty, they just wrote it and they sent it to you. Unfortunately, lots of designers and developers just copy and paste what their client gave them into the site and they leave it at that. And I'm sure you have been to websites where you go to read a blog post and that's what you see. Just big blocks of text and you think, yeah, all right, I don't have time for this. Then you go back to looking at dog pictures on Facebook. You want to break up your text, right? We think about breaking it up. The idea here is you want your text, you want your content to feel easy, right? This feels hard, this feels easy. This feels like a lot of text. This feels like not very much. It's the same amount. It's literally the exact same words. But this one's broken up with headlines. It's broken up into smaller paragraphs. It's got some bolding and it's got a bulleted list. Bulleted lists are subconsciously like the easiest thing to possibly read. If you put bulleted lists in there and people are scanning and you're just rolling your page, they'll stop, read your bulleted list, and they'll keep on going. They stop for subheadlines and bulleted lists because they're easy and fast. That's print. <laughs> but I would say it's an H2. The only time you ever use an H3 is if you need to break things down further under an H2. Right? The biggest mistake that you can make, and it's one I totally admit that I made for years, right? Is I used headlines for design. Right? So I would have my H2 would be one color, my H3 would be another color, and maybe they'd be the same size. Right? When I first started doing web design, nobody told me that was wrong. So I totally did that. Um, and then you learn and you realize that the H1 is the most important thing on the page and you only should have one. And then H2 should be the rest and you pretty much should never use anything else unless you need subheadlines underneath that H2 to break down the content in that section even further. So in this section, these are only H2s because there isn't any subcontent or subcategories or sections of content underneath that. You also want to use color. If you look at this first one, very hard to read. If you look at this, easier to read. If somebody's scrolling, they're going to stop and look at the subheadlines and that bulleted list. And then with color, it's even easier to read because that pink, in this case, stands out and it grabs their attention and says, wait, I'm something different. This is a different section, look at me, right? So you wanna use color. The idea when you're looking at formatting content is to use short paragraphs, right? Think about newspapers. In a newspaper, paragraphs are never more than like one to three sentences. In a newspaper, some paragraphs are one sentence. If you look online, Right? It's different than designing something that's going to be printed. If you look online, more and more and more websites that are content heavy are having shorter and shorter and shorter paragraphs. Because the break in between makes the content feel, again, easier to read. So you're encouraging people subconsciously to read more and stay on your site longer by making it easier for them to consume your content. Is there color? Is that one of the brand colors? Or can you use something? If you, well, like this is just, this is just my example, okay. but on your website, you would stick to your two or three core brand colors, right? Yep. All right, so let's talk about design. No sliders ever, right? Sliders, yes. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Sliders happen when there is a lack of decision making, a lack of clarity, and a lack of leadership. Sliders happen when nobody is willing to say, this is what we're going to do. Sliders are the result of too many cooks in the kitchen and nobody willing to put their foot down. Yeah, right? It is the way that everybody can get their way without hurting somebody's feelings. If it's a committee or a group. Right? You have sliders when lots of people have opinions and nobody's willing to tell somebody they are not getting their way. Or if it's a single person, maybe you, you put a slider on your site because you don't have enough clarity about your brand and what you're communicating that you couldn't decide what to put in that one spot. 
or you were unsure of the best thing to put in that spot. And because you were unsure about that or unclear, you went with a slider because then you could have lots of things there. But the studies show that sliders are terrible for conversion. They tank conversion. The studies also show that you should never plan on anybody seeing anything other than your first slide ever or never reading the content on anything but the first slide ever. So even though you couldn't make a decision, and even though you put a slider there to have lots of options because you couldn't make a decision, people are still only going to see the first one. And it's okay if you lack that clarity, right? It's okay. It doesn't mean that there's something, that, that there's something wrong. It doesn't mean that you're bad. It doesn't mean that you know, your website's going to fail. It just means you need to do a little bit more work on content strategy. You need to do a little bit more work on the messaging for that particular page or that particular spot in the site. Most of the time you see sliders up at the top because people aren't sure what that first thing needs to be. What that single statement is when someone comes to your site that says, you are in the right place. This is what you have been looking for. Keep on browsing through my site, right? It's really, really difficult for business owners for website owners to figure out what that statement is that's going to speak right to their ideal client and get them to say, this is totally what I've been looking for. I'm so glad I found this site. I'm going to look at every single page on the site and then spend four hours on your site. Right? It's really, really difficult to figure that out. And sliders are the, I need to get this done. Let's just put something up there solution. So we say no sliders. Take the extra time to figure out what your message needs to be. A slider, have you ever been on a website and something is rotating and different things are going through, right? The, there's one caveat. The only time I advocate for a slider is maybe when it's in a portfolio where you're moving through samples, a, a hotel site where you're showing pictures of the property, right? A wedding venue where you're showing pictures of the venue. Most of the time, these sliders are not at the top of the page, right? They're in the middle, or they're on the bottom, or they're not on the home page, right? They're on interior pages of the site, right? Where they're used to display image galleries. They're not used to communicate core content or thoughts, right? So that's the only time I think sliders are good. Yeah. Yeah. All right, the other thing when it comes to design is to do the expected. So many people are like, I want cutting edge, my site needs to be amazing, I want to do something nobody else has ever done. And they do weird shit with their design. <laughs> and then they're like, how come my site isn't working? Because like, you put the logo in a weird spot. Or you put stuff where people don't expect it to be. You innately just made your site harder to use because things aren't where people think they should be. Almost every single website on earth has the logo in the top left hand corner. Some put it in the middle. But most are all on the left. How many times have you been to a website and you've seen it on the right? Anybody? Never. Right? So you want to put it on the left because that's where people expect it to be. Because people expect that if they're ever in the site and they need to get to the home page quick, they can go to the top left, click the logo, and they go right back to the home page. They've been trained that websites work that way. The same thing with the navigation. Logo on the left, navigation on the right. It's where people expect to find those links. It's where people expect to be able to click and move through your site. Right? When you do the expected, moving through your site and using your website innately just becomes easier. Right? And it becomes more familiar. And it helps build trust faster. People do business with people they know, like, and trust. When people come to your site, they need to figure out if they, they need to get to know you, right? What do you do? Do you even do what I need? Who are you? They need to figure out if they like you. Like, do I like your perspective? Do I like your approach? Do I like what you have to say? Like, are you a jerk? Or do I think that we might have fun working together? And then they need to have trust, right? They need to trust that you actually can deliver what you say you can deliver. And when things in your site are in weird places and they're not where they're expected and it feels difficult, you're eroding that trust and you're making it harder for people to trust you. The same thing is true, your primary menu at the top, your value proposition of why you're the best, why you're in the right place, why people should hire you or buy from you, at the top. The same thing is true, call to action, 
right? If it's a landing page, if it's, you're trying to get people on your webinar, whatever it is, you want at least one call to action at the top, right? Sales pages are longer, you're probably gonna have a whole bunch of them all the way down the page. But stick that call to action up at the top. People expect if you have a search on your site, it's gonna be up in the header, right? Or it's gonna be up at the top of the page. Same thing, social icons. I know that you might not agree. Put them in your footer. There's a reason, right? When social media first like got super huge in like 2009, and everybody was like, I want everybody to connect with me on social media, put it everywhere. And everybody put the social media icons in the header. And in their navigation bar, and at the top of their sidebar. And they're like, put the social media icons where everybody can see it on every page. Great. But one thing people forget is that for every single social media icon you have on your site, you're inviting people to leave your website. You're inviting people to leave and go to Facebook and see pictures from their mom and their friends and their kid and get sucked into somebody else's blog post and they forget what they were doing in the first place. Right? Linking to Facebook, to Twitter, to Instagram, to Pinterest, to wherever. SlideShare. Every single one, you're sending people away from your website. So people expect you to have social media links on your website. They expect you to have those somewhere and they expect to be able to connect with you. But it is in your best interest to put them in the footer so that those people who really want to connect with you can more and more and more sites are all putting them in the footer. It's becoming an expected place to find them, right? But it's there because those who want to connect with you will go and click those links, but it's not taking people out of your conversion funnel. It's not taking people out of the natural flow of moving through your website and taking action. Because when you put them at the header, when you put them at the top of a, the, you know, your sidebar, you're telling people to leave, you're interrupting the sales flow. As people are moving through your site, instead of getting to that point where they're ready to opt in, instead of signing up for your newsletter, instead of buying something, they're leaving. Right? So have those links, but put them at the bottom. Same thing for any admin info. If you've got a membership site, if you've got anything like that, put that login down at the bottom because what you want to keep, your core primary navigation menu, is for getting people from I just found you to I'm going to pay you. Right? That core navigation is, I just got to your website, and then how do you get them? What do they need to know to give you money? Everything else needs to come out of that primary menu. Next is to honor hierarchy. Right? We always laugh, and I just was talking to my daughter about this because they're working on a school project and they have to design, she's taking graphic design and business in school, and it's been quite comical for me to watch her school projects. But she's arguing with her friends about something that they had to lay out because her friends kept saying, we need to make this bigger. We need to make this bigger. And I'm having nightmares of like, make the logo bigger. I'm like, ha, ah, you have to deal with what I have to deal with. <laughs> but what I had to share with her is that when you make everything big, nothing is big, right? When you make everything bold, nothing is bold, right? When you bold one thing, it's because you want it to stand out. But when too much is bold, nothing stands out. When you make something big, then you change that proportion to be bigger than everything else to stand out. When you start making everything else bigger, then nothing is bigger, right? So you want to honor the hierarchy. Right? Things that have low visual importance. Right? If they're not critical to your sales conversion, if they don't have a really high visual importance on the site, you want to make it small. You want to put it at the bottom of the page. You want to drop the contrast lower. Right? That's why you see lots of sites that have those as seen on logos. Like as seen on ABC, NBC, Huffington Post, those. That's why if you look at the majority of sites you see them on, they're gray. They're not full color, they're not black, they're gray. So they recede into the background a little bit because they are there for trust, they're there for social proof, but they don't need to be the first thing you see. They don't need to stand out and have top billing and hierarchy. They can recede into the background a little bit and be a secondary visual, visual item. So they're there, but they're not prominent. That's why you have their low contrast. 
right? If you have a call to action on the page, but it's not the call to action, for example, a blog post, you have an opt-in, and then you have links in your blog post, right? Like on my site, my opt-in button is pink, and then I have links in my blog post too. My link is a call to action to click. My blog post is a call to action to opt in. But one is a button and one is just a text link. Because text links aren't viewed as important as buttons, right? So if it's less important, but and it needs to be a link, make it a text link and not a button, right? If it's low visual importance, it's surrounded by other things, right? Those as seen on logos, they're all grouped together because it's a lower visual importance. If something is really important, if you really want people to see it, if you want it to stand out, if it has high visual importance, it needs to be big. You want to put it at the top of the page. It needs to have high contrast. If it's a link, like that opt-in link, it needs to be a button, maybe a big button, right? And you want to surround it with white space. So you'll see these kinds of things, right? They're not cluttered together. They'll have lots of white space around it, they'll sit on their own, and they'll stand out. The same thing is true, spacing matters. Brent always gets mad at me because every site I look at, that he's like, come look at this, come look at the type stack and tell me if it's approved. And I look and I'm like, I want more space above my H2. And he's like, no, and I'm like, yes. Um, and we always argue about it, but spacing matters. This is the exact same content, but on the left, it all runs together as one block. And on the right, with just a tiny bit of spacing added above this headline right here, now all of a sudden it's two short sections. The one on the right feels easier to read than the one on the left. The one on the right, it's two short quick things to read, where the one on the left is one bigger block. Right, so spacing between things matter. So I always say, when you're designing your site, add some extra margin or padding above that H2 and give a good solid break right there between sections of content. Now as we wrap up, there's some critical, critical reminders I have for you. The first is clear is always better than clever, right? You don't need to be cute, you don't need to be clever, you don't need to come up with something totally unique that's never been done before. Clear will always win over clever because clear is easy, right? You want to always ask yourself, right, is it easy? One primary call to action per page, right? One primary call to action. So on a blog post, if you've got your opt-in, right, make your opt-in that one primary call to action and then you might have some links in your post and that's okay, right? On a landing page, one primary call to action, right? You're not asking people to do multiple things. If you are on, one of the things when we design sites, I look at the blog and the, and the pages, two separate things. There's a money section of the site that's designed to get you from, I just found you to, I'm giving you money. There's a money section and it's all the pages like the portfolio, the services page, the testimonials, the about page, the contact me and give me money or fill out my phone page. Right? I'm moving people through that process of no like trust, give me money. Right? Those pages that are all about conversion, the only opt-in, the only call to action on those pages is fill out my project inquiry form. On the blog, then you look at, for, like when we're designing client sites, the blog has the opt-in. It's education, it's expert positioning, right? It's authority building, it's resource giving, it's helping. That is where the main call to action there is get on my list, right? If you're on a blog post, you're in the learning from me phase. People can learn from you, they can buy from you, they can hire you, right? They can learn, for you, learn from you for free, get on my newsletter, buy from you cheap and hire you for the most money. That's usually when we're looking at service businesses and things like that, those are our categories. On the blog, people are typically in the learning phase. So the natural next step is get on my list and keep learning from me, right? And then once they're on the list, you're driving them to the money pages that are getting them to either buy a course or buy a product or buy something cheap so that then you can continue to upsell them into paying you lots for consulting. So one primary call to action per page because a confused mind doesn't buy. If you have hire me and sign up for something free on the same page, people are either gonna do nothing or they're gonna always go for the free thing. 
You also want to reduce distractions. Short sidebars, and again, rethink those social icons. And put as few things as possible in your sidebar. If possible, put nothing in your sidebar but your opt-in. Right? You never want your sidebar to be longer than your content. And anytime you're going to add something to your sidebar, ask yourself, is this going to move the person on my website closer to a conversion? Right? Is this going to help them? Does this add value? Will this get them closer to a conversion? If you're just adding it in the sidebar because you think it should be there, or you want it to be there, or you're like, well, oh, just put it there. You know, take it out. Right? The fewer distractions as possible because it needs to be all about driving somebody to a conversion. Hiring you, buying from you, or learning from you. Practice safe web design. Avoid web decoration. We have clients that like to decorate. They make changes and they ask us to do things just because with no purpose. We call that web decoration. That's design without a purpose. Web design, every decision you make has a purpose. A purpose to make it easy for the client. A purpose to get someone to a conversion. A purpose to move somebody to the next step of the buyer's journey. In design, things have a purpose. In decoration, you're literally just making it pretty. Right? And great web design isn't just pretty, but it's purposeful. Right? You still want it to be pretty. You want it to look good. But you want it to look good with a purpose. So again, I'm Jennifer Bourne. You can find me at jenniferborn.com or Born Creative. And we've got some time, so we'll open it up for questions for a little bit, and then we will wrap up. Oh, yes, these slides are available at slideshare.net slash Jennifer Bourne. If you just Google slideshare Jennifer Bourne, you'll find them. Yep.